Hey guys, it's Sarah from Just My Typewriter and I'm back with content. So I recently received this comment on one of my videos that was asking me to go through and talk about how I make a YouTube video. I made a video maybe a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago about how I used to film when I was filming in a studio at my old university. But since then I've moved around a lot. So I thought today we'd sit down and just talk about the process of making content for YouTube and Instagram. And also, it's the end of the week and the end of the night, and I have to paint my nails. So we're gonna do that too. Welcome to Mumble and Manny YouTuber edition. So every great video starts with a foundation, as does your manicure, which means I'm going to start by putting on some Bonder base coat underneath the color of my Manny. So we're gonna find out if I can talk and paint my nails at the same time. So many of you probably know that I started my YouTube channel in about 2018. It's about the same time I started my Instagram. At the time, it wasn't going to be a hobby project for me. YouTube was a school project. I had taken a master's course and our final project was to make content for the internet on a niche topic. And for some reason, I chose typewriters. And I made a couple of YouTube videos and I made a couple of Instagram posts as well as a website and a little PDF booklet. But I really didn't know where it was gonna go. And after I had gotten through the process of passing this class, making all this content, I kinda had a lot of fun. So I decided to keep going and make more stuff. When I started, I was making about one video a month. That was kind of my goal while still going to school. And eventually that turned into a video every other week. And at some point during the pandemic, I switched to a one video a week release schedule. And that really kind of changed the content creation process for me. I had to figure out a way to formalize just about everything I did to make sure that I was consistently releasing videos that made sense. And it also meant that I had to come up with a lot of new ideas on my channel. So farm to table, idea to YouTube product, starting with the idea process. When I'm coming up with ideas for a new video, I do a couple of different things. I actually have a list on my phone of just ideas that'll hit me randomly that could be good for a typewriter video. There's some odd ones on there, but I kind of collect ideas as I'm going out and doing all kinds of things, thrift antiquing and all that sort of stuff but because I do film for a weekly or now bi-weekly schedule I do have to come up with content rather quickly and consistently pump it out so what I'm doing now is I will go through and do some research to come up with new video ideas I have alerts on Google on eBay on Poshmark for new typewriter products and every once in a while I'll go through and just search typewriter on some of those online resale sites some things kind of turn into videos without me planning or researching ahead of time. Thrifting videos end up like this for me. I will plan to go somewhere to thrift or antique, but I'm not ever sure that I'll have enough content to turn it into an episode for the YouTube channel. So sometimes I'm just kind of guessing. I will film as much as I can and hopefully it turns into a video later. I typically also do this because in case I buy anything, at least I have content leading up to the process of finding that machine. So that process is a little bit different than these more planned videos that I have in front of my wall. So those can be kind of hit or miss. And then when it comes to this kind of content, I'm planning based on what I have. So I might run into new cleaners when I'm out shopping, I might purchase a new machine, or I might just have to come up with an idea and I'm going based on what I have here or have found recently. Some ideas I find by just running into random things. The Barbie typewriter was one of those. I just ran into a random article about the Barbie typewriter and it sent me down a research hole, which I never came out of. But once I have my video idea, I then start the shooting of b-roll and researching and scripting processes which is going to lead us into our base after our base coat i'm trying out a new polish but i think it's going to need to go over something because these tend to be kind of sheer so i'm going to go in with one of my favorite orly shades this is fireball and we're just going to lay down a base color of this really quickly everybody hold your breath the next part of the content creation process for me is building out that concept for a video so i'll start with like a main idea and then I will go through and either do more research, I will start to collect items that'll go into the video, I'll shoot B-roll, which is secondary footage. So anytime you see a shot that's not me sitting in front of this wall, it's considered B-roll. So that would be um, any insert shots I have of individual machines. In cleaning tests, that's the actual cleaning of the machine. Anytime I have something on the table, 
or I'm shooting it um, close ups, that's all B-roll. And I start by filming that so that I know what I have when I go in to film this stuff, the stuff in front of a wall. It just kind of gives me a baseline for what I'm trying to aim for while filming. And it gives me the basis of a story. B-roll shooting happens at the same time as research. Some videos require more research than others. It just depends on the topic. So for example, if I don't own the thing that is in front of me, when I'm talking about it, like the, the Golden Touch typewriters that I talked about from Underwood is one of those examples. A lot of the research comes into play with the scripting. I'm not filming with physical items I have in front of me, so a lot of the additional shots that I have will be pictures of advertisements, screenshots that I've taken, close-ups on those sorts of things, which is a different collection process for B-roll. So anything I'm physically shooting, I'm using my camera to shoot here in my apartment, which I've kind of designed to be a little bit more modular for filming purposes. Anything that is a screenshot of an advertisement or a website, I film on my computer. I film those using the snip and sketch tool on my computer to take screenshots. And then I will use Zoom to screen record. And that's a great way for me to just kind of add more visual elements into an episode. Sometimes when I'm talking about stuff that requires you to Google things or use the internet, I can talk about it, but it's kind of hard for you to visualize what you have to do unless you're looking at a screen showing you that thing. And especially when I'm talking about topics where I might not have the physical product, it's really helpful to have additional footage to kind of take up space. I hate watching content where it's all one shot all the time. It gets really boring really quickly, and I mess up a lot when I talk, so I edit a lot, and I try to cover as many edits as possible so it's not super jarring. So often, I will have to cut in between things, and I'll cover those cuts with a piece of footage or a piece of B-roll. As I'm doing all the research, I'm also working on my script for whatever project it is that I'm doing. I don't script out every single word that I do. Uh, I come up with like main ideas. If I'm doing research on a topic that requires specific dates or specific concepts or uh, specific names of parts, anything that has to do with a typewriter from the advertisements where I'm discussing the colors, the dates that they were manufactured, other names that they came under, I typically will write all of that down in a note on my phone. I don't write it on my laptop for some reason, I'll do all my research on my laptop, but then I like to transcribe it into my phone. It's a lot easier to just have my phone with me here when I'm filming so I can quickly look at it and, and figure out what I have to say in the next moment. I am a teacher, a professor, and so I do end up having to talk extemporaneously just about every day to my college students, but I do like to have some sort of plan or structure when I'm working on a video. It makes it a lot easier to edit, and then I can be sure that I'm never gonna forget anything. Specifically when it comes to dates and manufacturing and tips that I have for you, I like to write out at least a concept of that on a note on my phone so I can go back in and follow it as I'm speaking. For example, for today, I have a list of the things that I wanna talk about in order on my phone so that I can go through, and when I get distracted by things like my microphone turning upside down or trying to paint my nails at the same time, I at least know where I kinda am in the structure of things. The night before filming, I will go through and kind of set up everything. I'm the kind of person who likes to film in the morning. It's very odd that I'm filming at night right now. It's about six o'clock. I like to get up in the first thing in the morning and just film, get it out of the way. The night before filming, I will set up the background behind me. I'll put all the typewriters in the place that I think they should go for the shot. I'll set up my lights. I have three lights that I use in addition to my overhead lights in a couple different rooms. I'll set up my camera and also set up my audio recorder. These are all pieces of equipment that I've had for a really long time. I like setting them up the night before and then doing the final adjustments the day of. My typical filming setup is I like to have my camera in front of me, obviously, and then I do use three lights. I use one on each side. These are LED panels. They kind of blind me a little bit to look into. And then I have a third one that I put behind me. This is called three-point lighting. The idea is that it's supposed to help cancel out shadows you might have in your background. I don't use them the way that you're supposed to use them. You're supposed to have one key light, one fill light. Um, and they're supposed to kind of give you some balance across the way. I use these two in front of me at full blast to light up the entire screen. And then I use the one behind me to light up the background a little bit so everything is just a bit brighter. I also set up the camera and I set up to have it focused on me. Most of the time it's in focus. I do use an item in front because I'm always filming. I put something in my chair and then I will focus on that to make sure that everything's in focus. And then the final piece of equipment I set up and I usually wait till the morning to set this up 
especially now that I have a cat who might eat wires, is I set up my audio recorder. Typically this guy sits down in front of my tripod and I use the uh, USB, not USB, I use the XLR. That is the word I'm looking for. I use the XLR from the device, plug it into an omnidirectional lavalier mic. God, it's the end of the night. I will then feed that lavalier mic up through my shirt so you don't see the wire typically. I don't know why I didn't do that today. And then I will use that as my audio device. I do record my audio separate from my video. There's a couple reasons for that. This is also pretty normal in the industry of filmmaking, film processing. The camera audio that is on this camera is not very good. For example, here's what the camera audio sounds like without any backup additional miking. You can hear it's pretty quiet because I'm kind of far away from the mic. The second you add on the second layer of audio recording, you can kind of separate the two and do more editing to the audio that you might not have been able to do on the camera audio itself. I also have some technical issues with my camera. It shuts down every 12 minutes and I like to keep the audio rolling longer than that. So if I'm at the very end of the sentence and the camera cuts out, I have still the audio there and I can play some B-roll over it and make it look a lot smoother. Once I kind of have everything set up, I'm focused and I'm ready, I will typically put on nicer clothes. I might put on makeup or at least eyeliner and I check my audio, I make sure everything's in focus. I'll sit down and film a video. I always start with the introduction. I like to go linearly because I can edit it a little bit easier. Always end with the conclusion. After I give my final sign off, I might add in a couple other comments that I think might be really useful if I missed them earlier in the video. That's where I get to redo things and then add them back into the edit later. So if I forget a date or I forget a factoid, I can kind of say it then and throw it into the video at the right time. The filming process is a little bit uh, different than what I used to do in the TV studio that I was in or when I was at home. I specifically designed my apartment when I moved in to be a little bit more modular to allow me to move things around, but also leave my filming equipment set up all the time so that setup didn't take as long. When I was filming in a studio at my campus, I had a room where it was quiet and I had a great background and everything like that, but it wasn't my room only. I shared it with everybody else at the university. So I had to set up, film, and tear down in the same day. When I was filming at my parents' house, I was using my sister's room, our guest room, to film when she wasn't living there. When she was living there, I was filming, oh, it must be dinner time. When my sister was living there, I only had my room to film in. I would take my mattress and my box spring and I would push them up and lean them against the other wall in my room and I would film in the back corner of my room where my bed usually sat, which meant that I could only do that when I tore apart my room and then put it back together afterwards so I had a place to sleep. So moving to this place, I wanted to have a space where my typewriters were constantly on display and that I could also leave my lighting kit set up all the time and my camera always on a tripod so that I could set up really easily and tear down really easily and just kind of make that process a lot more or simplified for me. I don't have to tear everything down every time. Not everybody's process is like that. It really depends upon where you live, but this is now so convenient. It's gonna be hard for me to let this go. The filming process for a main video, one where I'm with this background and a vlog is very different. When I am vlogging, that's a little bit more on the spot. So that would be like my thrift trip videos. I'm not always sure that they're gonna turn into a main channel video. I always, when I'm doing those videos, I try to record an introduction before I go into the thrift or at a different time, some sort of introduction on my phone. I then try to make sure that I get establishing shots of wherever I'm going. So signs, the outside of buildings, um, I like to get footage on the way to where I'm going. I like travel footage, so outside the window of moving trees, uh, the street signs when I'm driving, all those things. Once I'm in the store, it can really be difficult to get good footage if there's a lot of people there, if there's music in the store, and if the lighting's not great. If there's music in the store, I can't really use the audio from those videos because it'll copyright strike me and I won't be able to monetize my content here on YouTube. We'll talk about that in a little bit. If there's really poor lighting, thankfully my phone has been pretty good at adjusting for it, but sometimes it's just dark. And if there's a lot of people in the store, I get more nervous about filming in general. So there's a lot of factors at play when I'm in those environments. I typically take really short video clips. When I'm filming on this camera, I film at 12 minutes ago for each piece of footage. When I'm filming in a store, I try to get 10 seconds of footage, but that can be really dependent upon motion, people in the store, lighting, and all those different aspects. So filming a vlog can be very different. All right, we're gonna go in with a top coat of this one. This is Pandemonium by Mooncat. I've never tried this before, so we're gonna try it now. 
Filming a vlog is a little bit more casual. I think I can get away with a few more hiccups in filming. I do have some tips though for filming on your phone. I've noticed over the years, phones have gotten much better. I don't ever take like a physical large camera into a store. It just makes me uncomfortable personally. If you go in and play with your phone settings, you can actually get some pretty good footage out of them. I have set my settings to film at 4K. I was filming at 1080, which is normal for cameras. My camera films in 1080p. I'm filming at 4K just gives you more data within your footage. So it can make images look a little bit sharper on screen than they might in old phones but it does take up more storage space. So if you're filming in just HD, which I do recommend you at least film in HD, 720 is getting kind of old, so I, I move up to 1080 if I can. When you film in a higher levels, it does take up more space. So filming at 4K limits how many hours of footage I can actually store on my phone. If I'm going somewhere for a couple days or I know I'm gonna be filming at least several hours worth of footage, I might change the uh, size or data type because I just can't store it on my phone for very long. But I do take the video and then immediately remove it from my phone by putting it in a Dropbox and uploading it to my computer so that I can kind of clear that space out really quickly. I don't like to keep a lot of that content on my phone very long just because it takes up a lot of space. Video is always going to take up more space than audio when you are editing as well. So I like to keep that in mind. But when you're in a pinch and you just need to film a little bit, I think higher quality turns out a lot better and it gives you more to play with, especially when you are working with settings on your phone. Nice thing about your phone compared to a camera setup like this is a lot of things are automatically done for you. I don't have to adjust ISO on my phone or aperture, even frame rate that is set within your settings on your phone and you can change that if you want. Typically they're filming at 24 or 30 frames per second, which is how many pictures they're taking per second on your phone. 24 is standard for film production. 30 is standard for television. It just looks a little bit different. A lot of films now, or a lot of TV shows now are filming in 24 frames per second. 60 frames per second is often used for more fast moving things because it allows you to do slow-mo. So sports, for example, would be filmed in 60 frames per second. Uh, activities, snow activity, snowboarding, all that stuff would be specifically filmed in that 60 frames per second if you want to be able to slow it down and still have enough photos to go through to give you a really smooth transition when you're in slow-mo. So I did set up my phone to film at 24 frames per second just to be a little bit more high quality. Now that it's in 4K, it's, it's filming at a different frame rate. Um, it does take up more storage space, but I just think the content looks a little bit better. You can tell the difference between stuff filmed on your phone and stuff filmed on a camera, I think. But I do think that there's such an advantage to filming on your phone, especially when you have to move around a lot. If you're in a store, it can be kind of hard to move around with a camera, especially if you're also including an audio device. If you're filming with your phone, the mic in here is closer to the camera. So you can kind of record all those things at once. And if you're filming with your phone, you can only hold it away from yourself so far. So it should still be able to pick up audio from that distance. So filming in those vlog environments can be a little bit tough. It's a little bit tight in there, but I do like using my phone in those environments because it doesn't necessarily mean I have to make a video out of it if I don't have enough content. And it also means that I can get into tighter spaces and film things when I'm not even planning on accidentally ending up in an antique store. When I am filming in this setup, I do have some equipment that I specifically use. And this is equipment I've collected over the years. And this is more like YouTube based creator content. This is the kind of stuff that I learned how to use when I was in school. Anyone can learn how to use this equipment. You just have to be willing to press buttons and mess with things. And I think some people get a little bit intimidated by that. So the equipment that I have here, I'll start with my light kits. These are great video maker light kits. It is an LED panel. I have three of them. They come with tripod stands that you set them up on. They do plug into the wall. You can get batteries to plug into them so you can remote film with them if you don't have power. They're pretty nice. They have the ability to also change the temperature of the light if you want a cooler light or a warmer light, depending on what kind of environment you're in. You can also change the color, which is something I really liked about them. You can adjust settings. So you'll see sometimes in the back of videos, I might have a green light behind me or a purple light or a pink light behind me. I can kind of adjust the tones of the lights and I really like that. You can also adjust the strength of the light. I have most of them up pretty high because this room sucks up light. 
but I do kind of like the amount of options you have on these lighting kit. These I was able to purchase because I won a grant uh, for teaching when I was a student. So I think they were $250. That's not bad for a lighting kit. The equipment that I was using before was equipment that I was borrowing from the school. I carried it around in a plastic tote and I was really the only one who used it. So I kind of got away with using it for a couple of years. When I was getting ready to leave IUP, the school that I was at, I won this grant and I knew the one thing I was gonna need because I already had a camera was lighting. I had no backup plan for lighting besides the umbrella lights I was borrowing from the school. So I went in, got a bunch of recommendations and purchased these ones. I really like them. There is one thing I don't like about them is they have these barn doors on them. The bottom barn door doesn't allow me to tilt the lights in a way where I can angle them down. They are limited to kind of standing up straight and then also only facing straight. The the slide on the bottom, I wish I could remove it, and I probably can with a screwdriver. It would allow me to tilt down a little bit more. Because I shoot downward on a wooden surface sometimes, the table, I do have to kind of adjust my lighting to make sure that that works. But otherwise, I really do like these lights. They do come in a carrying case, and they're pretty convenient. Those are pretty user-friendly. I also use a separate audio device from my camera. This is the Zoom H4n Pro. It has two XLR inputs on the bottom as well as an XY mic pattern across the top. What this means is you have three inputs for audio. You can use the built-in mics across the top, which when I was filming at IUP, I had one of these that I was borrowing and that's all I used. I didn't have an additional mic. I just used those mics across the top and I would set the recorder on a chair in front of me, hoping it would pick up my audio. The two XLRs across the bottom allow you to plug in additional mics, which I do now use. I, when I purchased mine, got it with two mics, a lavalier mic that was omnidirectional and I think a cardioid lavalier mic lavalier mic. So I plug it in with an XLR cable and then I plug in my microphone, which I attach to my clothing. This means that when I'm filming, I have at least two audio options. I've got the XY mic pattern across the top and I do have that initial um, omnidirectional mic as well plugged in. Now, when you go into edit your audio, because you're plugged into one of the XLR inputs, it only comes in on one side because there are two inputs, one's on left, one's on right. I always have to go in and edit the audio to double it to fill in the left or the right channel because it only records in one channel. That's not a big deal, but you might notice if you use something like that, that you are recording only in one channel and all of your audio is coming through one headphone. So I do have to go in and hit fill left or fill right on all of my audio. I also go through and EQ it. That means I equalize the different levels. There's a lot of white noise that happens up in the higher range of frequencies and a lot of lower rumbles that happen at the lower end of frequencies, things like my fridge or the heat in my building. Those things can pop up in audio. So I tend to cut those and I make kind of like an arch in the middle of my frequencies. I have a higher pitched voice and you don't always hear the medium tones or the low tones in my voice. So I tend to boost those a little bit and I lower the nasally tones in my EQ as well, just to kind of give it a more rounded feel. You'll hear sometimes though that I bump around the mic. Sometimes my hair gets in front of it. Sometimes I'm moving my arms and it brushes a cable, which is probably happening in this video. Anytime you move a mic, it's gonna make noise. So that does pop up in some of my content and that just happens when you're using an external device. The XY, matter, XY pattern microphone is nice to use as well, but I always use that as a backup. Because it's not close to my face when I'm talking, it picks up the rest of the room as well. So it can get a little bit of an echoey effect because I don't soundproof where I'm at. The camera that I'm using is one that I've had since high school. I bought this camera with my high school graduation money. I was so excited about it, used off of eBay. It is a Canon T3i. I bought it because you can both take pictures with it and film with it, but it is specifically designed for photography. I am a Canon girl through and through. I probably will never switch brands, even though I know people like Nikon. Lucas. And this the industry standard right now is kind of more Sony, but for a long time the industry standard was Canon and I wanted to be able to work on those types of cameras. The school that I was going to for my degree was a Canon school, or at least they said they were. So that meant that I would have equipment that would be comparable to what we'd be using in the classroom, which is why I purchased the Canon T3i. There are some advantages to using a camera like this. You do have the ability to do some more manual settings in it. I can set my ISO, my white balance, 
my aperture, my frame rate. I do have quite a few options in the manual settings on this camera, which I do like having access to. And I do like that I can use it as well to take photos. A lot of what I do now, especially for Instagram, and for some of those insert shots is I have to take photos. When I was going to be a student, I knew I was gonna be taking photography classes and I needed something that I could at least use to pass those classes that wasn't my phone because the idea was that you had to have a camera to take some of those courses. So I wanted something I could use in that environment. The video settings on these camera are an added feature. They are not the primary function. So it does lead to some things that aren't great on these cameras. One thing that really has bothered me over the years is that the cameras themselves, at least mine does, shuts off after 12 minutes of filming. So every 12 minutes, my video shuts down and it stops recording. Newer versions of the Canon cameras, the T5, don't do that anymore. They do split the file size itself. So instead of having two 12 minute videos when you're filming and have to hit record in between, it does just split your file for you into two 12 minute videos if you're filming for 24 minutes. That's a nice feature. It helps not lose data. I have been in many a dance recital and concert and play where I am filming for money for a concert video where my camera shuts down in the middle and you lose that section if you are not recording on a second camera. Eventually when I was recording concerts and dance recitals, I started renting equipment from my university so that I could at least have two cameras and I would use mine as a backup emergency camera so that it at least always had a shot to move to if something happened to the camera. The other thing this camera does is it overheats quite a bit if I am filming for a long period of time. I did kind of jailbreak my camera when I first got it by using a program called Magic Lantern. This doesn't exist anymore and that's probably the number one reason why I'm afraid to get a new camera. But this was a program that you could load onto an SD card and plug into your camera and kind of override some of the controls. The menu settings in this camera aren't super great for filming, but by jailbreaking your camera, basically using the software, you get a lot more additional controls. It kind of takes over and gives you more options. So for example, I could really change my frame rates, change my white balance settings. I have a lot more options using Magic Lantern than I do on the camera itself naturally. And so that's been really helpful for me, especially when I'm doing interesting photography like uh, light painting, for example, where you have to have a really long exposure setting. I've been able to do those because I have more options using Magic Lantern, but that program doesn't exist anymore. And so that's been really difficult for me to get over with this camera. I do have my camera also on a tripod. That is something that stabilizes your camera. For a while, I was just setting cameras on tables. There have been times where I have gone to film projects and we forgot to bring a tripod or we forgot to bring the plate the bottom of the camera goes on to go into a tripod and we have filmed using music stands. I have done that way too many times to count. So I do have my camera permanently attached or at least mostly attached to a tripod. I use a Manfrotto tripod. These are pretty industry standard. I like them. They pack up to be really small. They are a little expensive, but you, if you're putting your camera on something, you want it to be kind of static and safe because that is an expensive piece of equipment to rest on a music stand although I've, I've done it. So that is most of my equipment. Uh, do you need fancy, expensive equipment to film YouTube videos? Absolutely not. In fact, most days now, I recommend that people just use their phones. You can get apps to film on your phone that can increase your footage, that can make it look better by changing the frame rate, by changing the settings, by adding filters to it. There's a lot you can actually do within your phone now. And one of the advantages of using your phone is you don't have to be an expert in the lingo. I've had to teach people how to use cameras and I was taught how to use a camera before I went to school by a friend of mine. And I remember sitting there trying to understand how the triangle of ISO and frame rate and aperture all work together. And I didn't understand it the first 85 times he described it to me. I am so sorry to that person. Um, but it can be kind of difficult to learn all those things, especially if you're in a very quick learning environment. Your phone takes care of all of that stuff for you. So if you are not looking to learn a whole new language, 
your phone is a perfectly okay device to use. One thing I recommend that could really elevate if you're using phone footage is just getting better lighting. A ring light, as silly as they may look, and I know they're used for like TikTokers, can be really helpful to just elevate your shot a little bit. The difference between a dark shot and a light shot is detail. When you are filming in a really dark environment, your camera cannot pick up as much detail. It makes things look fuzzy. It might make them look like they've got static over them, that fuzz. We get that from not having enough light in a shot. So if you are filming on your phone, the number one recommendation I can make is to mess with your settings in your phone to get the highest quality picture. And then also just add lighting. Add flash, use a ring light, film in lighter places. It is going to help the quality of your content so much. The other thing I can really recommend is good audio. If you are using your phone to film, you might wanna get an external mic to record on. If you are holding your hand over the mic portion of your camera or over your phone, it will muffle out all of that footage. And if you are filming on your phone with external shots and then you need to go back in later and put voiceover, the difference between a really good mic and the voice memos on your phone is kind of drastic. The amount of mics they can get into a phone is kind of small compared to an external device. So I recommend if you're gonna film on your phone, you might wanna think about extra lighting and extra audio. It can really help in those environments when that kind of stuff just isn't separate. It's all packaged into one device. The next thing I do after I have captured all of my footage, this includes the B-roll, this includes the main shots that I have been doing, is I will go through the editing process. I put everything onto an external hard drive and I put them into subfolders. I have an organizational process where I put videos I finished in the typewriter um, finished video or the typewriter backups video. And then I'll put everything that I'm working on currently in a working folder and I'll subfolder them based on video ideas. I throw everything into one subfolder and then I use Premiere to edit all my videos. A good option for like new beginner people who haven't ever edited before is a program called We Video. This is something that my mom uses on her YouTube channel and also teaches it in a high school setting. If you are not interested in getting a subscription to Creative Cloud or Premiere Pro product, if you don't have iMovie or whatever the Mac equivalent is, um, WeVideo is another cloud-based editing service. You can link it to your Google Drive. It has the same kind of things. They're just in different menus and they're a little bit reduced, but it's not bad for you starting out editing if you've never edited before. My editing process, I detailed more specifically in my previous video, so I will link that down below. What I tend to do is I do it in steps. I will line everything up, my audio and video. I'll go through and cut things out that I don't need. I'll rearrange things. I will then start to layer over the B-roll that I had. And then in my couple final passes, I will fix audio clips and then also adjust the B-roll to be more aesthetically pleasing. The final step I do is add in music and then I listen through and play through and make sure everything looks nice. I will then export it. Once I'm uploading content to YouTube, I have to add in a title, a description, tags that I might be using. I also have to determine if the video is going to be monetized or not, which means it makes money off of being played. And then I also have to upload a thumbnail. The thumbnail is really an important part of branding your content. This is something that I always do last while the video is uploading to YouTube. I go in and I have a preset size in Photoshop and I determine what the front image is of that video. That is what's going to draw people into watching your video in addition to the title. So I usually try to put a typewriter in there or a lot of typewriters. Putting a lot of typewriters seems to be very helpful. I have a couple of mainstay backgrounds that I use across the board. I try to make sure that they at least look like they all belong to the same channel. And I try not to put too much text in there because people just aren't gonna read it, especially when it's you know this big on your phone. So the thumbnail is the last part and then I schedule the video. Right now I am doing a bi-weekly schedule. So I put out a a video every other weekend. When I initially was filming at that weekly basis, I was putting out content every week and I tried to be at least three or four videos ahead. Right now I'm two videos ahead, but I have four weeks in there. So it's kind of the same schedule at least of filming and making sure I'm ahead on content. I'm just releasing fewer videos to allow me more time in between to work on other projects. Okay, we're in top coat territory. We're getting there. And now we wait. In between releasing content, I do like to check the analytics that I have on the creator side of these platforms. So I check to see when people are most likely to be online watching my content. I check what kind of content is doing best on my platform at a time. And I check what kind of comments I get. All of this leads me to informed decisions. One of the things I've been very conscious about as a YouTube creator is the audience type that I have. 
I am not here specifically making content for the diehard typewriter collector. I find that my content is better utilized to get people into collecting. So people who have just bought their first typewriter, who maybe are interested in typewriters or who have a few who are looking to repair them, I do not make videos like Phoenix Typewriter that does deep dives on repairs. Those are fantastic. It's an amazing resource that we have. I could not possibly compete with him. He just knows so much about what he's doing. And that's an amazing resource for people who are looking to do repairs. And Joe Van Cleve, I love Joe Van Cleve's content. He does a lot of really interesting things. He does a lot of deep dives on specific models from a writer perspective and a user perspective. And I think those are so fascinating and good. And I'm a huge fan and I fangirled a little bit when they mentioned me in one of his videos. But but I think for me, I found that my niche is that initial user. People who are just interested or who saw one and might want to Google it, I get to bring people into the typewriter community and I can kind of act as their fairy godmother along the way and that's where I really like to be. So the ideas that I have for videos are less deep dives on specific things, they're more like introductory content, which is why I started the Typewriter 101 series. I decided that if I was trying to talk to people who were buying their first typewriter, I should probably guide them through the process and those are really great resources that'll still exist as my channel can channel continues so like my typewriter 101 where to buy a typewriter how to clean your typewriter those videos are resources that people can find at any time to go through and use to start their process of hoarding typewriters I get a lot of people who will email me and say hey I just saw your video for the first time or I found you through this video I have a question can you help me and then I'm able to guide them to other more professional resources within the typewriter community I am a hack when it comes to repair when it comes to cleaning I am just kind of not capable of a lot of those things mechanically. My mind is not built that way. I get through, I manage to make the machines in my collection work, sometimes with a lot of external help. But when it comes to creating content, I'm identifying that audience of first time buyers, first time users. And that's where a lot of my content comes from. The ideas that I have for things are that introductory level for people. It's also the age of or at least the type of student that I teach at my university. I get a lot of freshmen because I teach a large lecture freshman course of 130 people. So I'm kind of your first introduction to college, which is why it's good that I'm goofy and loud and talk about TV in class. So when I'm looking at the analytics side of YouTube, it also helps me make informed decisions. I know that my 101 series gets a lot more views than my keyboard reviews do. I do know, however, that my keyboard reviews have better newcomer rates than my other videos. So people who are looking for specific keyboard reviews might see my video, and those are new people that have not subscribed to my channel before. So that kind of influence can dictate what kind of content I make, but I'm also looking at comments to figure out what people are looking for. They might comment ideas. I had a person tell me that they, or they sent me an email and they were a younger person and they told me they didn't like my keyboard video reviews very much. So I stopped doing them. I have lower view counts on videos where I'm including nail polish, which I totally understand. So I've kind of stopped doing those unless I'm using it as a hack in some way. The Barbie content's kind of hit or miss. I love making the Barbie videos, and I think it's an interesting resource to have on the internet, but they don't always do well view count wise. So I try to space them out a little bit more. It seems like if I do a cleaning video or a thrifting video every other week, people will continue to come back and watch it. But some of those more niche topics aren't as applicable to as wide of an audience. So that does kind of direct where I'm going when I'm making content. When it comes to making content, there is no wrong way. And I think everybody should try it. I think it's a really creative process. I personally find it very fulfilling. I had a YouTube channel since I think at least sixth grade when I got my first camera. And I remember making fake shark attack videos fake ghost adventuring videos with my sister. I filmed everything. I have all of the archives of all of that footage. I am also the family archiver. I have all of that footage. I used to do a series when I was in college called Dear Mom, where I made a video diary to send to my mom every week on a YouTube channel, which is kind of a really cool way to connect. I like projects. And for me, this is a very fulfilling project. I get to both physically do things, but also write things plan things. I'm a planner. I like projects. And then I get to also engage with people on the internet after making it. 
and I've been really proud of the progress that I've made here on the channel. It's been five years of making content for just my typewriter, and I have hit 7,000 subscribers, which is huge. I'm very excited about it, and I get emails all the time and DMs all the time of people who are buying their first typewriter, and they wanna ask me questions, or they wanna thank me for getting them into the hobby, and that to me is probably the most fulfilling part of what I do here on the channel, engaging with people who are just excited about typewriters for the first time. And I get to communicate with like a lot of strangers that I would never meet in real life. I'm actually in real life, very introverted. That's why I can make so many videos. I don't leave my house. But being able to engage on the internet and kind of be that not character, because it is my personality, but there is a camera in between us, so it's a buffer between our social interaction, has been really positive for me. And it's also given me a great portfolio when I go into jobs to talk about the fact that I get to do this every week, and that's where I'm still using those skills that I have from my degree. So I hope that covers everything about making a video. This is kind of a longer, really intensive, nobody asked, well, one person asked for this, kind of deep dive into how I create content. I encourage you, if you're going to start creating content, just start making things. If you make all of these rules before you can start something, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to do this, you'll never get started. Just start filming things, fiddle around with editing software, make stuff that's fun. Don't feel like you have to come out with your final opus as your first video. Just make something that you love making. Making that Royal Road Test video was probably my favorite thing to make on the channel and it didn't do very well. But I was at a time in making content where I was upset with making content and working on something fun made me engage with the process again. So always feel like you can just make stuff that you like. It doesn't have to be consistent when you start. It doesn't have to be congruent with anything else. Just make things to get over the fear of not. And as you go along, you can start to think about things like a consistent posting schedule. That's the number one way to grow a YouTube audience, post consistently. I think also identifying your target audience. We talk about this in marketing classes. Know who you are selling your content to and think about them every time you make a piece of content. If you use a lot of jargon, you're gonna lose the people who don't know what you're talking about. So make sure that you are thinking about who you're talking to and what they are interested in to drive that content as you're trying to grow your audiences. Consistency is key and quality of content. I find that to be a really important part of making my videos. It's really important to me that they look good and that they're easier to watch. It's not painful, hopefully, to watch some of my content. So if you're interested in actual videos about typewriters, I have a lot here on this channel. I also have an Instagram at just.my.typewriter. I want to thank you all so much for watching and remind you that you're just my typewriter. And we did it. They're dry, I think. <laughs>